hello, everybody. Uh, good, good morning. Um, we're at the World Bank uh, cafeteria, uh, and uh, we are going to have a very interesting conversation. I'm here with Masoud Ahmed. He's the president of the Center for Global Development. Uh, we want to talk about development, have a conversation, and then bring in uh, bring in the audience uh, where we can. So I'll give just a just a little bit of a start, and then you can give a little start, and then we'll see where we go from there. Um, uh, the, the basic context that we're in is a very difficult one for developing countries. The, we've we've uh, talked a lot about the crises uh, that they're facing, multiple crises, uh, and also the inequality that's built that has built up uh, in in the in the world. Uh, that's a combination of much of the response to COVID was uh, was channeled through the advanced economies and stayed there and left developing countries behind. We've had reversals in development uh, on a number of fronts, on poverty, but also on education, on median incomes, and other, and other key indicators of development going, uh, going in reverse. That's a giant uh, challenge and a crisis for itself because it adds to fragility and it's bad for uh, uh, people. It, as, as the food crisis now uh, hits and fertilizer and farmers under pressure, it raises the risk of, their, of, uh, of, of uh, uh, famine or of, of hunger certainly already growing and malnutrition growing. So that's the general context. Uh, I've argued for various policy uh, changes in the advanced economies, but also very much in the developing uh, economies to, uh, uh, to counteract inflation, to uh, prepare for the interest rate hikes that are coming, and also the climate changes uh, that, are, that are ongoing. Uh, from a program standpoint, the World Bank has tried to respond to the COVID crisis and now to the uh, uh, to the latest set of crises uh, uh, from the from Russia's invasion uh, of Ukraine, we've tried to respond with rapidly and with size. And so that's the context that we're in right now, with the bank going through its biggest uh, uh, surge of uh, financing, and uh, we, we it started with COVID, and it, we're in another wave of uh, another surge now. So it, with that as a context, w welcome, Ahmed, and uh, I know you you know this field well from all your history, but you might please start us off, CGD and yourself, and... Uh, <laughs> That, thank you very much, uh, uh, David. Uh, it's always great to, to be here. I should say it's always great to be back because uh, one of the important things about my life is that I actually spent 20 years working here at the World Bank, so it's very much like coming back home for me. Um, and as you just said, uh, David, so this, he, at the Center for Global Development, uh, we've been following what you've been doing, what other institutions have been doing, what the IMF is doing across the street, uh, um, and most importantly, the impact that this crisis uh, in terms of food, energy, fertilizer costs uh, going through the roof has had on countries that were already suffering from all the previous crises. And, and I think what, what we don't recognize often is that here in Washington, most of you, almost everyone here is wearing a mask. Uh, but really, when you look outside, you go around here or in, uh, in the US, in Europe, in Japan, rich countries where the majority of people are vaccinated, we're putting the COVID crisis behind us. We see that as something that's over and we're beginning to focus on the next phase. And yet, if you go into most developing countries where probably one in six, one in seven people have been vaccinated, COVID crisis is still very much part of their lives for this year, for next year. So they were already struggling, as you say. And maybe that's a good place uh, from which to start. Uh, and, and you said, uh, Dave, the bank had come forward with a 170 billion, if I remember right, is the number of the surge over the next 15 months, which is actually slightly larger than, the, than what you had done in response to COVID. Uh, that was at the time of the spring meetings that you announced that. That was a month ago, and last month has seen a continuation of the war in Ukraine and, and expectations about high food and energy prices. It'd just be good to get your take on 
in talking to all of the country representatives and, and policymakers, how do you now see this impacting particularly low-income countries, but also those middle-income countries that are very exposed in terms of their financial markets? Because a lot of them have borrowed money, both sovereign and the corporate sector. Interest rates are going up, market conditions are tightening. That's going to have an impact. So just I really think that we'd appreciate your take on that. Exactly, Masood. Uh, the, so the, it's, it, it, the, the data has been worse since the spring meeting. We were trying to anticipate some of that, and I think we did that. I was last last week uh, in, uh, in in Europe at the uh, at the uh, the development ministers of the G7 met in Berlin, and then the finance ministers and health ministers met in uh, uh, in Bonn. Uh, so I participated in those meetings. So I have a sense of uh, how that group is thinking. Uh, and very worried about uh, how can there be enough support for developing countries uh, in, with both groups, the middle income and the poorest countries, uh, being, being discussed in terms of fragility, but also in terms of the pure monetary uh, effect of the price surge, the price uh, uh, spikes that are going on now. So the, I guess the way, uh, one message that I have really think is important is uh, that as Russia's, as the world moves away from dependence on Russian energy, then the new supplies uh, will be vital. And so one, as we look forward one year, two year, and three years, uh, this is not a short-term crisis that we're in, and it will depend, or the severity of it will depend on on uh, uh, production worldwide. That's farmers planting crops, getting fertilizer. We know in the advanced economies, most of the farmers who want fertilizer will be able to get it, but it's coming at the expense to an ex uh, at the expense of diverting supplies uh, that would have gone to developing countries. That's very clear in LNG, liquefied natural gas, which is a vital building block for fertilizer and for cleaner energy. So what's happening is the LNG supplies get diverted to Europe, and that means in developing countries, they burn heavy fuel oil, they burn diesel generators for the well-to-do, uh, and the farmers aren't getting the fertilizer, and so the crop yields will be down. And so that's the immediacy of the, of the crisis for developing countries, whether the low income or the middle income, they're both facing the, this uh, uh, price spike problem. Uh, and I, th I think we have to focus on the best solution uh, will be massive new supply, the, a much less beneficial solution is to divide up the existing pie because the, the unfairness of that is the, the advanced, the richer economies will get what they need and that means shortages elsewhere. Which is exactly what we saw 18 months ago with vaccines and, and uh, when you saw the distribution of vaccines which were in short supply and it wasn't just that the vaccines were going primarily to rich countries but that sometimes you found that in many rich countries, we'd ordered way more vaccines than we were ever going to be able to use. And we ended up actually throwing some of them away because we couldn't use them in time uh, at a time when those very same vaccines could have gone to help and protect uh, frontline workers uh, who were dealing with the pandemic elsewhere. Oh, the, the one, one difference is if you think of the total amount of money needed for vaccines, not counting the R&D, but the actual just cost, is relatively small, was relatively small. So if there had been a way to allow the developing countries to contract and get in line for the receipt, uh, that uh, there, there would have Absolutely. been enough money to go around. In this particular crisis, the, the, the size of the... Uh, the financial needs are much bigger. That's because energy and food and fertilizer are a much bigger part of the global of economy than the vaccine cost. So we need, we need new ideas and especially uh, 
it, so I'm, I'm just making a little of the distinction that for vaccines, what there needed to be was fairness in contracting so that the poor countries could, were, would uh, be able to get contracts that were executable. This, this time around, uh, it's not so much that, it's the actual um, uh, uh, allocation of giant parts of the global GDP uh, where, where uh, the advanced economies will take first dibs on right. a lot of it. Right. And I think that's a fair point. Mm -hmm. um, I want to step away, I mean, we could talk a lot about the current crisis, but I want to just step back a little bit and maybe go into an area where I know the World Bank group has been doing a lot more over the past few years, which is the work that you're doing in, in fighting climate change. And uh, one of the things that a lot of people talked about at the spring meetings, uh, which just got a, uh, a month ago, was whether going forward, the World Bank and development banks uh, more generally should be doing something more or something different in relation to climate change, pandemic uh, prevention, global health security, global public goods, if you like, as the term. And, and some people may have seen a speech by the US Secretary of the Treasury, Janet Yellen, in which she was pretty pointed in saying that uh, the World Bank shareholders at the World Bank uh, as, a, as an organization needs to think, I think the term she used were think creatively of solutions that uh, that go beyond what they're doing country by country. I'm trying to understand how you interpret that move towards greater focus on global public goods. Is it do more of what you're doing? So, you know, if you look at your numbers on climate-related lending, both in the absolute and as a share, they've gone up. So you could say, look, we're doing that. We could raise that further. Is it something doing differently? Is it the same in low-income countries or middle-income countries? Uh, how, how do you both understand and then respond to this call from shareholders for the World Bank to become much more focused on uh, global public goods and, and climate in particular? Um, yeah, uh, so I, I think it's useful to have that discussion, and so as, the, as, as that's put forward, uh, that encourages the bank in a direction that it's moving, but to, to your point of does that mean more of the same? No, it means, uh, it means the, a, an even faster evolution of the bank. Uh, and so global public goods uh, extend our climate in part, that's things that are, are within a country, but that have big impacts outside that country. We can even think of vaccination as a global public yeah, good in that it, it uh, helps the world if more are vaccinated because of the variants and, uh, uh, and, and that aspect. And I think it's also including refugees. As people move across borders, it affects everyone. So we view it that way. Uh, the bank's been evolving uh, pretty quickly in those areas. One one part of it is spending more on climate. As you know, the World Bank is the biggest, uh, by, by far, half of the uh, finance of international financial institutions of all of them, of the IMF and all the other MDBs, the World Bank is half of the, half of the total and has, has grown rapidly in recent years in the financing. But then for climate, on, for climate. On climate, yes, for climate. Yes, yes. Uh, and another aspect, or what, what we then want to do and have described in our climate change action plan is help the world find and see that it goes way beyond uh, uh, ambition and pledges and conferences that when you when you get into climate you want you have to be talking about projects that reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, which I think has not actually been discussed all that much I go to the conferences and there's there's very little discussion of what actual change is is going to happen so we World Bank have put forward a very ambitious uh, climate change action plan built on the idea of or on the on the on the process to integrate climate and development to identify projects that will be impactful that's very important it's not how much you spend on the project it's how impactful how do you finance that impactful 
project and how do you work with the governments to actually get it done. Uh, so we're doing the, the uh, now a new diagnostic climate change, uh, co country climate development re reports that are coming out on individual countries. What can the country do to reduce greenhouse gas emissions? Now this has been very well received by the international community. I was just at the G7, they've, you know, their, the communique and the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the discussion at the table is very supportive of what the World Bank is doing to lead so strongly in this direction, that we have to have people talking about impactful projects on greenhouse gas reduct emission reductions. So that's methane leakage, uh, which is one of the big greenhouse right. gas, uh, gases, um, and that means concrete projects. Which pipeline in which country? Who's going to, going to work on Turkmenistan? Who's going to work on Russia now that it's, uh, now that it's uh, started a war? And other major uh, methane emitters around the world. Uh, and then uh, um, uh, coal-fired power plants is a big category of emissions. Of course, agriculture and land use are big, and industrial users of the steel industry, the cement industry. So in, in Uzbekistan, what changes are going to be made to reduce the carbon intensity? So the World Bank has active big programs in some of the big emission uh, countries. I don't want to ignore adaptation. 50% sure. of our climate finance goes to adaptation that's unique in the, uh, among international financial institutions, and so we are pressing forward with that, uh, and it's particularly relevant for the for lower income countries because by and large they aren't producing much greenhouse gas emissions. They're feeling the impact of it. So yeah. we balance that. I think uh, it's and I, to emphasize, it's uh, very strongly supported and well received by the international community. And so what I think uh, we want to do is continue evolving that. And the big challenge is finding the most impactful projects. That hasn't really been the direction of institutions in the past. It's maybe been here at the World Bank, but we're, we're putting more emphasis on identifying projects that will actually matter and make a difference, uh, and then work with the governments. We're working with South Africa, with Vietnam, with Indonesia, with India, with China uh, on impact. Right. So if you do a fast forward, let's say we 10 years from now, when you look at the portfolio of the World Bank and uh, look at middle income countries in particular where the bank is involved, you, know, you, you could have two, two visions of it. You could say, well, we'll be doing, you know, our basic design is to work in each country according to what the priorities of that country are. There could be climate, there could be education, so we'll be everywhere. We'll probably be doing a bit more climate in different places. Uh, Another vision could be to say, you know, we are basically going to become a climate and development institution, and that is what we will be offering as an offering of choice, if you like, in middle-income countries, not because the other things aren't, aren't important, but because this is the area where the shareholders of the institution or, or the World Bank can make the biggest difference. And it's a spectrum, obviously, and I'm just trying to get a sense from you of, as you look out ahead, do you think that, w which end of that spectrum are we likely to be closer to in 10 years? Uh, there's been a big ramp up in climate financing, so I, I'm comfortable with where we are, and I think the world is Good. comfortable. We have a 35% uh, target yep. for our new commitments. That will gradually mature, meaning then the portfolio will reflect that. Yep. But what I think is really important is that the quality of each of those loans will go up, meaning the impact. Uh, so you, 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 you can have a billion dollar loan that was called climate change but didn't really have much impact, or you can have a billion dollar loan on the portfolio that's very impactful. So what I'm hoping we can do is have the quality of the lending go up. The, the reason to avoid having the target go up uh, is because it subtracts dollar for dollar from education, from child nutrition, sure. from uh, uh, w our work on gender equality and, and violence against women and so on. And so do, do you really want to reduce that? I, 
my contention is what we want to do is make the climate spending that we're doing, which is massive, it's our biggest chunk of our portfolio, uh, make it as impactful as possible. Yeah. You know, people talk about the 100 billion per year. The World Bank alone is a quarter of it. So I sit in the G7 meeting where the World Bank alone is more than all the G7 spending by a lot. Uh, and so it's very hard for them to say World Bank should do more. What, what really is needed is the global community to recognize that it needs to participate in impactful projects, uh, and we're looking for the pooling, the finance pooling, that will allow that participation by the global community. I, I think the point about impact is really important to emphasize because we did some work at CGD, a couple of our colleagues uh, looked at the projects that were done by some of the climate funds. And uh, just to try and see what is the unit cost in terms of a ton of carbon averted. Uh, and first thing is that a lot of the projects don't have the numbers to be able to make that call. And that, it, that already is a problem. You know, we need to have the data to be able to decide what's the best uh, use of limited resources. And then where you do have the data, the variation in the dollar cost per ton of carbon uh, varies from 1 to 50. And there's no reason why we should be having such a wide variation. And uh, that's basically because we haven't yet introduced the discipline that comes from so many years of doing effective project preparation, project evaluation, supervision, appraisals that help to make sure that you get the best value for money for, and, and the money's gonna get limited. No matter how you look at it, the needs are gonna be multiples of, of what is going to be available. So I, I'm very much uh, in favor of that. C could we, I know we're gonna, we could run out of time soon probably, so I, I do wanna go to another uh, topic, if I may, which, which you have been very vocal about, David, personally, and I think the bank as an institution has been very much out there. And this is the issue of uh, the growing uh, burden of unsustainable debt. Mm. There are plenty of numbers out there. No, I'm not gonna spend time walking you through on how many countries have the problem, et cetera. What is interesting for me are two things. One, that for a variety of reasons, we can go into that and I'd appreciate your view on this. The problem is gonna get worse this year than it was last year. Uh, probably this year, Sri Lanka is not the only country we're going to see. I can think of half a dozen other countries, and, and, and I know that uh, people in the World Bank have said the numbers even higher uh, that are going to run into difficulty this year with managing their debt uh, repayments. And we seem to be incapable as an international community to do anything about it. So you wrote out, here's a set of things could be done to make the common framework work better, put in a standstill, put some better definition of, uh, of comparable treatment, put in some uh, uh, timelines and, and process clarity, uh, get the private sector to the table. These things have been out there for months now. Kristalina uh, Georgieva, the fund has said the same things. Um, everyone's pointing out the problems. And uh, I guess my question to you is, time is passing, countries are getting into trouble, we've pointed out how to fix it, um, and here we are now, May is ending, we're halfway into the year, and I don't see us any closer to, to, to moving from diagnosis to action. So what, what's holding it up, David? How do we move forward? Do, do something, right? And hey. the, the real world consequence is poor countries are still paying yep. a lot on their debt. So that means it's in direct opposition. They're facing higher prices for everything. And then in addition, seeing the interest rates go up and they're paying out right. to creditors that by and large are wealthier than they are. Um, and so big problem. Um, well, there's multiple aspects of it. One is starting today, wouldn't it be good if we could avoid having non-transparent contracts into the future, ones that were more subject right. to Absolutely. rescheduling? We can't even get that. So, uh, you know, a starting point is stop making the problem worse. Uh, but uh, every day, 
we see contracts that are written by lenders with developing countries uh, where there's a non non disclosure clause so we've we've asked to stop that. China in particular uh, began that process in roughly 2014 of putting it in standard into contracts that the contract can't be shown to anybody. Well, that reduces accountability. So we'd like to get that and have some principles of transparency for contracting with sovereign governments. We, you know, we do that now in uh, IDA. So there's something called the SDFP, which is the, the uh, sustainable debt uh, uh, fin f sustainable debt uh, finance pro uh, process. And so it works with the uh, IDA countries right. to have some standards for how they're borrowing. A problem is they don't always follow that, and then what, what, what's the pressure? Because they're under pressure from the lender to say, please take my money. I know it's a high interest rate, but you'll get lots of benefits right now, and you'll only have to pay for it over the next 10 years uh, or 20 years in some cases. Some of these contracts are long term. So as far as what we can do, one is uh, bringing in the G7, the G20, and really asking them, uh, don't you want a stronger process? We've tried to, we, working with the IMF, uh, we've made proposals to them on ways to improve the process so that there can actually be a debt restructuring for countries that have, uh, that are unsustainable. Zambia is in that process. Unfortunately, uh, even though they 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 uh, started it well over a year ago, still there hasn't been a meeting of creditors. At the G7 last week, I proposed to the group uh, that rather than waiting for a creditors committee to form, have creditors meet on a monthly basis, meaning don't wait for someone to call a meeting, but just have a uh, a monthly meeting of creditors that would bring together the private sector creditors and all of the official bilateral creditors. That's China as well as the Paris Club. So we'll see if that can work. There are other processes going on to try to, on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, solve the various ones. One uh, idea that uh, is out of having the debt sustainability analyses be reviewed by the boards of the IMF and World Bank. That would allow a more inclusive process uh, so that there's, there's a, a consensus of opinion on a that a country needs a debt treatment and a debt restructuring. So there's some concrete things going on, but the, where we stand today <clears throat> is it's a fully stalled effort, and basically the countries keep paying month after month to well-to-do creditors. We would like to see the private sector uh, take more initiative, but remember in the in the debt sustainability uh, initi debt suspension initiative in the G20 mm -hmm. in 2020, the private sector was given a a, a free, free pass. pass. It was a, voluntary for you, uh, which meant that the big chunk of the debt was simply not going to be reduced. So through the COVID process, remember what happened, even the poorest countries kept paying month after month right, right. to rich people through their asset managers. No, absolutely. And, and you know, I just think it's extraordinary that here we are, so 18 months after we announced, the G20 announced the uh, common framework, and not a single country has actually managed to go through the process. And as you say, it takes a year to get a credit committee. And now you have Sri Lanka, where they're literally running out of cash every day, um, down to the last million dollars pretty much, and can't get an IMF program because you need to get assurances from creditors. You can't get assurances from creditors because you can't get a credit committee. And it's sort of like the country is caught in a catch-22. And it does seem to me that, as you say, the World Bank, the IMF, in some ways, I have to 
bring that whole process together somehow. I'll, right? I'll un unload a yeah. little bit then. If you think about, uh, so the G20 makes up a big portion of our shareholders. Right. So the group of 20 major, major yep. economies are major shareholders of the World Bank. They meet on an annual basis and then frequently during the year. And so as the uh, debt suspension initiative was being done in uh, 2020, uh, the, 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 the word kept appearing in the communique that it would be voluntary for the private sector. So the World Bank stands up, says, no, that will undercut the effectiveness of the agenda. Please delete that word it, then as it goes 24 7 the negotiation on the communique the communique comes out and it says it's voluntary for the private sector uh, and so that that uh, discussion of the of the major economies is hard to get inside uh, because there's you, you, you know different groupings uh, many of them are creditors uh, and yep. so that one challenge or one strength the World Bank brings is our board, our shareholders, are more heavily developing countries than most of the world's institutions. So I can assert that we're going to, uh, World Bank can be a voice for that, uh, but it's hard. Even at the G7, for example, where I was uh, last week, we're just an observer. And so the communique itself is written by the countries and you know you can kind of give suggestions but that's about that's about what they are so we work then with the shareholders and with the members to say wouldn't it be a good idea to make faster progress on this? Um, we should talk directly. Yeah. You know, China, I think, needs to be more forthcoming, and the private sector need to be more forthcoming in the willingness to see. In the long run, it's to their advantage to let these countries survive, right. and so let's find a way to do it. I, I think that's. I remember well the the process of drafting of communiques at these meetings. Mm -hmm. And uh, for some reason, they always start late in the evening, mm -hmm. the process. Predictably, they start late in the evening, and then it sort of works its way through the night. And I think there's a, there's a method in this, which is just that people get so tired by the end of it that, that you're ready to sign up to anything, because it's 4 a.m. in the morning, and, and people haven't slept for 36 this hours, voluntary, you know, and, 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 and then voluntary sounds yeah. good at 4 a.m. in the morning, you know. Uh, uh, but I think the key point is the last, the last thing you just said, which is that it's, it is in the interest of the creditors to have an orderly process of dealing with excess debt in countries because the costs of picking up a broken outcome are always higher. You know? and, and I think that's somehow that message hasn't got through. But I, before we end, I just want to go to one, one last topic, which I think follows on from your last comment. Uh, you said about China needs to be a bit more forthcoming. And I mean, the World Bank, in a way, is the World Bank, right? You have shareholders from every part of the world here. China is a big shareholder. The United States is the largest shareholder. And that's been its strength, that it is both bringing everybody into this one institution. But now, some of your shareholders are basically not getting on so well. There's tensions, and, and there's, it's more than tension. In, in fact, uh, geopolitics is getting tough. And I think it would be good to get your take on how do you think in a world which is going to be increasingly divided, geopolitics are going to be tense, what is the space for the World Bank? Does it be the, become the common space for people who are otherwise at odds to come together on common issues? Or does it get caught up in the middle of this big I wasn't going to use conflict, but I don't want to use that word, but, but it's, it's more the disagreements. Um, I, I think it's been okay so far. We saw a little part of that at the Development Committee a month right. ago, uh, where Russia the, yep. had, had uh, a, attacked Ukraine, there was a war going on, and it's a shareholder, so how do you handle that? And we tried to, 
to, so they didn't come at a high level, uh, and when their minister spoke by video, uh, s s some of the uh, shareholders walked out of the room. So it was a demonstration of, uh, of uh, opposition to what Russia is doing, but it worked from a, from a World Bank governance standpoint. Right. And we're continuing to operate as a board, our board is functioning uh, and can express S strong views on what's going on in the war, uh, and uh, it's inclusive with China, with India, with big uh, non-Paris Club creditors being fully, having full voice within the World Bank. So I think it creates uh, that, a space, space, for, space. For, for the world. A practical problem on the debt is that the composition of the debt has changed so massively over the last 10 years. So we've gone from a situation where most of the debt was contained by the Paris Club creditors to the point now where very little of it. So we have, uh, for example, Sri Lanka, just a small portion is Paris Club creditors, and yet the mechanisms of the world are still uh, set up uh, to be centralized around that Paris Club uh, creditor process. Uh, and that's uh, been a case in Zambia, of in course. Chad, and the others, where the, oftentimes the chair of the creditors committee has zero exposure, which is a which is not the way uh, debt restructurings used to be set up. And so that's, I think, an evolution of the system that's, uh, uh, that's going to be needed in order to reach more, uh, fair, more useful resolutions of debt issues. But then also it goes into trade issues and others. There has to be a recognition in the world of the, the big role of developing countries within the global framework. Right. And in climate. I Thanks. Know, I, now Anna, I know Anna's here. She's we're, getting we're anxious. Gonna, we're, uh, we're running over time here. Anna, tell us what we're doing, <laughs> and then we're, we're both going to continue the conversation with the audience. I think. Fire away. Thank you. Thank you very much, David and Masu. That was absolutely a very insightful conversation. So, in terms of process, what I'll do is I'll open the floor for questions. We'll start with an online question from our participants, and then we'll ask you if you could kindly raise your hand. I have two colleagues with mics. They'll come up to you, briefly introduce yourself, and then if you could ask your question in a very succinct manner so we allow enough time for Q&A. So my first question um, from an online participant, which is Dr. Onyango. And the question is, we're seeing more environmental disasters which are affecting development. What strategy has the bank put in place to combat these challenges while still helping with food security and infrastructure development? So I'll start off with you, David. And, and please join in as you go. You know a lot about these topics as well. What, the, one part of the answer is the financial instruments that we have. So we have within IDA the crisis response window that can address, and within um, uh, with, within we have uh, CAT DDOs, which are catastrophic deferred drawdown option uh, instruments, that where we work with the countries to be aware that they're. Uh, more susceptible to natural disasters. Um, and there are other tools, um, financial tools aimed at that. Then a second line I'll mention is biodiversity is a mainstream issue in the bank and we work with specific countries on ways to enhance that and protect the, the, the environment straight out. Um, and then uh, I would say a third is the surge financing process that we've demonstrated with COVID and we're now uh, uh, doing with the food crisis that as, as there are specific uh, impacts hitting countries, uh, the bank can respond quickly. Uh, Masood, would you have Look, I would just, comments to add? Just one footnote to, to what you said, uh, David, which is, I think one of the issues that we need to think about, uh, and the bank will think about, but the shareholders also, is whether the financial models of the bank support the roles that we want the bank to play. And I'm thinking in particular of set surge capacity, right? And uh, in IDA, you can essentially do it by drawing forward what you were planning to spend later, and that's, we just had a two-year replenishment in IDA rather than the standard three. So maybe the next one needs to be two years too with the next surge, you know, I'd be in favor of that. Um, but with IBRD, as I understand it, and the people in this audience, and I'm sure you do understand this much better than I do, but, but my, understand, my recollection is that there is built into the IBRD 
the capacity to deal with one big setback and one surge capacity of about $10 billion or so at one time. Now, if we are going to have, for example, a second crisis come on top of the first, how do we make sure that the financing models allow the bank to play the role in terms of surge financing that uh, we want it to play and that we sort of hold it accountable for play? Uh, and, and that's good. That's actually an active discussion yeah. now as we face this second surge. And it, there's actually some good news on that. There's more uh, uh, flex than you might uh, be aware of for one, uh, and I'll just mention a couple, but there are actually several. The capital cushion out of the 2018 capital increase uh, is expandable, so we used it first with COVID, and we're going to be able to continue that and add another layer of the cushion, uh, so that's good. And then uh, one other uh, uh, aspect that I'll, well, uh, we have Crossover windows from IDA that help right. with blend countries and with uh, with financing. And then I was going to also mention, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Uh, 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 there is um, uh, the capital cushion and the, uh, uh, and the, uh, I'm sorry, I'll have to come yeah. back to it and let, tell you. Please let me go, go to, to the live question. audience yep. and see if right. there's a question. Just, yeah. huh. So. Yes, the, the, the lady in the black shirt in, to, the, to my left, please, have, thank you for raising your hand. Kindly introduce yourself and if you could ask your question succinctly. Thank Hi, you. my name's Jasmine. I'm a member of staff here at the World Bank Group. Um, my question was about um, the current downturn and inequality. Um, uh, firstly, do you think that uh, we're heading for a possible global recession? And, and secondly, uh, Will growing inequality between countries and within countries be a feature of that, more than in previous downturns, perhaps? Thank you very much. Um, David or Masood, who would like to take that first? David, go ahead. Uh, I, I, clearly, there will be recessions in some countries, maybe many countries. The variables, though, are dominant in this. How long does the war last uh, with Russia? And also, very importantly, how does the world respond in terms of new supply? If you knew that today, you'd have a better estimate of wh how many countries will fall into recession. I'm quite concerned about it. Interest rate increases will be needed because we're running at a high inflation rate. So that, that gives us the the nature of the concern, the GDP growth kind of concern. There's slowdowns currently in, in China and in Europe, uh, and those are extending and having impact on the uh, on developing countries. Uh, and the inequality, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm uh, very concerned about that because the global system is set up in a way uh, that, that uh, leaves developing countries behind. That was true of the the COVID response by the advanced economies took the form of uh, big f de demand generating or consumption oriented fiscal stimulus, meaning they borrowed from global capital markets and then injecting it, injected that money into mostly the advanced economies. So there, it, uh, there hasn't been much penetration of that stimulus, same on the monetary policy side. And now as, as the response is going to the, uh, to the food crisis, it's got the same set of problems that actually add to the inequality. Thank you. Thank you, David. I actually would like to pivot to a question um, from an online participant, and it's actually posed for the two of you. So the, it's in, in on the education sector, um, which we all know is an issue and needs to be addressed um, with urgency. The most valuable kids seem to be suffering, and this is a question from D. And because they're either dropping out of school or they receive less quality education compared to their peers around the world. And in addition to that, there's a huge digital divide that exists between students here and students in developing countries. So what are your perspectives? How are we going to assist countries so that no students are left behind? Let me start off with you, Masood, and then ask David. So I want to say a couple of things about education. You know, we have been looking at this issue. My colleagues at CGD have been doing quite a lot of work on, on education over the last few years and what works, what doesn't work. And the number, the two big conclusions that have come from that for me uh, are one, that we all know that learning outcomes are quite varied and often quite poor 
in, in many countries, even where kids go to school, they don't learn a lot, and, and we've been very focused on that. But despite that, even with the poor learning, the returns on investment in education are high. So it's worth having the kids go to school, even as we work to make the schools better and more effective. I think that's just, it's important not to lose sight of that. Second thing that's come through for me is that in terms of one intervention that has been shown to have an impact on learning outcomes at scale, which is to say not just in limited numbers of trials of uh, tens or hundreds of kids, but across different environments, is school meals. If you can invest in providing school meals, you can easily scale up school meals because the technology to deliver school meals is not that complicated. And kids who are not hungry and are better fed learn a lot faster. So school meals make a big difference. And I think the, so the final thing I want to say about education is that there is a reluctance on the part of some finance ministers in developing countries to borrow money for education, but they're willing to borrow for other kinds of projects. See, the historic people used to think of hard sectors and soft sectors. I've never understood why you want to call it soft sector, investing in education, but that's how people just think of it. I think there's personally, there's no rationale for not investing uh, in education. And if you, can, if you need to borrow funds for that, that's fine, as long as your overall debt sustainability makes sense. It's the country level debt sustainability that matters rather than some sectoral, arbitrary uh, sectoral distinction. So I want to make those points. Thank yeah. you, Master Thank you. David, anything good, to add to good that? Good points, just building on that in addition to the school lunches, the hours at school turns out to be uh, important. Very and good. of course, the relationship with the teacher. I was in Morocco and saw a school where uh, the government was allowing money and the World Bank was, supplementing it, encouraging it, uh, to go to NGOs that were running the preschool program, and it, they, they have enough hours that it's really having an impact. Uh, so we, and I Absolutely. like your point on that. scaling it and getting the government to recognize that it's an investment that's critical. We highlight that in the Human Capital Index. Yeah. I want to come back to the capital cushion because I, I, I've had a chance to collect my thoughts. Uh, the, we're, we're using the capital cushion again now in this crisis. Uh, also, one change that's been made over the last five years or so is the transfer from IDA goes down a little bit when the World Bank's, uh, when the IBRD profit goes down. So it's, it, rather than being a fixed rate, so that allows or leaves IBRD in the middle income countries able to do some part of the surge. Uh, one thing that we did starting a year and a half ago was really encourage countries to switch from floating rate to fixed rate. They were able to lock in through the World Bank and we got a lot of billions of dollars locked in on fixed rates. So that's helping them uh, uh, withstand the interest rate rising environment. And then a fourth I'll mention, and there are actually quite a few more, is the scale up window in IDA has been expanded expanded substantially in IDA 20. So what that means is it makes uh, resources available to the blend countries uh, that can then uh, give some relief to IBRD. So the net result, and the reason I wanted to raise it, is we have the, the capital capacity to do this surge that we're doing, even though it's a second one. So your, your going in was right of, it was somewhat designed for one, one surge or one crisis, uh, but we are finding uh, ways to make it extend. Uh, critical in that is that IDA 20 starts now on July 1st, and it's bigger than IDA 19. So that's giving us more room. That's why we're able to say 170 billion now. The COVID was a big stretch for the bank. That was $150 billion, 150, for the 15-month period that started in April of 2020. Right. So now, two years later, how is it that we're doing $170 billion? Well, we've, we're using even more tools to the maximum, and also we have IDA 20 coming down, down starting up in, on July 1st. So it's 
a key part, and IFC's capital increase came in just in 2020. So all of those measures are adding to the, uh, and we're stretching as much as we can. And I want to thank all the World Bank staff, you know, working from home, getting huge amounts of output. It's been good, but I'm really encouraged to, with physical presence here today. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, David and Masood. Let me just turn back to see if we have any questions um, within the live audience. Yes, please. The gentleman in the middle, on, on the, in the white shirt, please. If you can stand up and briefly introduce yourself and ask your question. Yes, uh, thanks very much, uh, David and Masood. I'm Philip from the German ED office here. I have two questions, unfortunately. The first is, you laid bare the lack of resilience that countries had in both the COVID crisis, but also the, the current crisis. And you responded with a uh, grid approach, green, resilient and inclusive development. At the same time, you published a Changing Wealth of Nations report, which actually showed that sometimes you can have flow measures that increase, but that the stock measures, human capital, uh, environmental capital and, and physical capital can be reduced. So my question is, how can we make sure that the country engagement model, the guidance for staff, both on the analytical side and on the sort of strategic side is fully consistent with this new approach uh, that, 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 we need to, uh, that we need to implement. And the second question, because you spoke if, on... If I may, very can, can he answer that? And yeah. I'll come back to okay. you, I promise you that. Let me just give him a chance to, yeah. to answer that question. I'll, I'll give a strong... So we, the bank has uh, country uh, uh, approaches and knowledge approaches. We need to apply both. And so you're exactly right, the flow versus stock, that we need to have a way that countries can look far forward and recognize they have to build human capital, for example, which doesn't have an immediate payoff. But that should be embedded in the country partnership framework. So the CPF, uh, which, is a, which is a primary and important document uh, for the bank that gives a kind of a five-year forward look of what we're planning to do in a country should be picking up those changes. Those go to the board, the board comments on it, and that's a useful iterative process. So I would say to Masood and to, every, to all the stakeholders, um, I'm encouraging input and particularly most helpful is where you see a World Bank program and you, sh and you say, this is a good one, do more of these, and this one doesn't look so good, uh, try to avoid that because the World Bank has you know an array of programs 30 different kinds of programs uh, and so and there's not as much input as you might guess or as you might think uh, there should be on which ones uh, really look like they're effective so we're trying to build those yeah. you, is there a second uh, could oh. I just add, add a point on that yes please other, go ahead I may, which we'll is to back. Philip's yeah. question you know what I, I think, look, the biggest challenge in organizations like the World Bank or similar organizations is once you have a strategy or a vision at the level of the board, at the level of senior management, how do you operationalize that so that it begins to show up in the actual activities that are being done by a whole number of de relatively decentralized uh, units. And in the case of the World Bank, I agree with you very much that you have a country partnership uh, uh, strategy. And I think that's the moment at which each of those has to be reviewed, not just in the context of whether it it's makes sense in itself, but how much it coheres with the strategic direction that has been laid out. So if you come along with a country partnership strategy in a middle income country where you've got very interesting things, but nothing in there about uh, uh, climate change or global health security or the challenges that we're facing as an institution, as you are committed to do as an institution, I think there's something missing in that strategy. And that's always a source of tension. You know, I, I, I always feel that in a way, it's the hardest part is to say no to good things because there's nothing in those country partnership strategies generally that doesn't make sense. It's just not what the institution is driving to achieve at the aggregate level. That's well, the small, challenge, right? Small point, uh, you know, we're working hard on workplace culture. Right. And one key part of that, relevant to what you're talking about, is contestability. Uh, so we've got 
practice groups within the bank and regional groups. And we've also got IFC and MIGA, which have loud voices and are, and are and, and need to be included as people think about. And so there's an oh, the operations committee Absolutely. sits that that has an ADM that governs how the input comes from around the bank, and that is supposed to maximize the benefit. So those are done, you know, there's a big one coming up, I think, this week still. Today's Thursday. I've lost track of which day. It goes to the operations committee, and there needs to be active discussion because it brings in lots of voices to say, uh, it, because it's exactly the problem you name, that it it's no good if, if 20 different groups have gotten their words into the document. That doesn't give enough guidance to the country director and the programmer, right. programming operations to say it's vital that this country achieve progress on X. And that's what we're looking yeah. for. Thanks. Thank you, David and Masu. Let me go back to Philip, please, if you, if you could stand up and, <laughs> I'm and, sorry to come, and to your come second question. Yeah. That's fine. fascinating <laughs> topics. Because you spoke of the G7 communique, I just want to quickly quote from the finance minister's communique, which says, we re-emphasize re our call for private sector involvement in all debt restructurings in line with the comparability of treatment principle and look forward to continuing work with the international financial institutions and market participants on improving the architecture for such participation. So I, I, I just thought this is an interesting uh, call uh, uh, on the bank as well and curious how you interpret uh, that, that statement. I I like that a lot. Uh, so it's very good, and the G7 has been supportive of what I've been trying to do on transparency and debt, debt transparency and debt sustainability are critical, and they've been uh, uh, they've been uh, v engaged in that. They, the each each of the G7, in fact, has been engaged. The problem, and not to pick apart those words, those were great words, but as they say, comparability treatment. I've, you know. That's been vague. Over the last 20 years, there is a concept of comparability of treatment. I've suggested uh, that it, that it uh, clarify the rules of how do you evaluate and implement, uh, those are key words, how do you evaluate and implement uh, comparability of treatment? Because if you simply call for comparability of treatment, that ends up uh, giving lots of loopholes for many of the creditors to not actually reduce the debt burden for the country. So I, that's, I, that's giving you a nuance of this. I was uh, very happy with the G7 discussion and the support uh, on these topics. But as we push it forward, the details end up mattering. So if you talk about Zambia or you talk about Chad and you say comparability of treatment, Everyone kind of agrees with that, but then does that actually end up with a debt treatment that's beneficial for the people of those countries? Absolutely. That's a different question, and we're working on, so that's why we have so many people working closely with the IMF to get a good outcome. Thank you, David. Yeah. I think we have enough time for perhaps just one question, and so I'd like to go back online. And this is from Esther. And she's asking, how can high prices for fuel, commodities, and other products be lowered? And she gives an example in Uganda, where she is from, the high prices are impacting low-income households and also middle-income households. So perhaps let me start off with you, um, Masood, and then go back to David, if you have any thoughts on that question. Well, I, I would just say that I think we need to recognize that prices are a reflection of what the market conditions are. And, and administratively, you can't raise or lower prices except by acting through taxes. So sometimes you can have an impact, and many countries do have a mechanism built in. When the price of food energy goes up, they try to uh, cut back on the taxes that are generally placed on those energy products. And, and that takes a hit on the budget, but it have, may ease off some of the price. The more important thing to me is, can you scale up support for the low-income household? The question said, I think, yes. that is particularly affecting uh, low-income low households. Yes. Can you scale up the safety nets and support the households rather than the product? So don't subsidize the product provide help to the people who need the extra resources to cope with the higher prices. 
That is what economists prefer, but it's also now more feasible because one of the great, uh, you know, one of the things that happened in the context of the, of the COVID crisis, one of the, the better outcomes was that countries really worked on scaling up and improving their safety net mechanisms. Many more countries have functioning safety nets today than was the case two years ago. And so it's more feasible to use the safety nets to provide additional resources targeted to the people who need it. Providing cheap gasoline for people to use the top 20% of uh, households income-wise are the largest users of gasoline in developing countries. And providing them with subsidies by subsidizing gasoline is not a good idea. Uh, on the other hand, using that money to help the low-income countries, uh, low-income uh, households deal with their costs is the better way to do it. And I think you and I, David, had a conversation, maybe I'm thinking 18 months ago, a year ago, in the middle of COVID, where you said, well, one of the things the World Bank could do, actually, is to say, in five years, we will be helping 50 countries doing, uh, putting in place effective uh, safety nets. So I, so I would say that is the direction in which I would uh, focus. Well, thank you, Masood. David, do you have further reflections on that? This is a huge, uh, uh, important topic uh, that countries do it to help the people in the right way and not be tempted by some of the wrong ways to do it. Uh, and gasoline is a great one. You've got to allow the price to go up and then subsidize uh, or household, poorer households. Um, I happened to meet yesterday with the, our digitalization crew, uh, which is right. large, and we're really pushing forward with social safety nets because they provide, for technology is giving us now something new in the development community. There didn't used to be the way, a way to get cash and benefits to targeted people because you couldn't take physical suitcases of money to a village and distribute it in a fair way. It just didn't work. We now have, through technology, the ability to uh, have uh, someone's digital phone with money on it. Uh, and it means women can get money, which there used to not be a way to get money to women. And that's the most valuable money for, uh, for, for people in developing countries, uh, the woman getting the money. And so we can target that now. And uh, Mikhail was on yesterday. Uh, he's uh, head of the, of, the, uh, of the social safety net uh, uh, efforts, and we are trying to expand. We haven't reached 50 countries, but he was talking yesterday about we have sturdy systems now in a lot. I did just notice the UK announced that they're going to, in order to respond to this much higher electricity price and gas price that people are facing, they're going to put money in people's bank accounts. So they're using some kind of social safety net, uh, which is better. At, so economics is really clear that what you don't want to do is put a cap on the price of the price spike. You want to, in some way, let the price go up at least some. Uh, and then try to cushion the, the cost on people. I, I need to mention other things. Countries need to avoid export con controls that block the exports from leaving their country. The temptation by countries is to do that. They also need to avoid the temptation to buy heavily the imports uh, uh, so the government can hold down the inflation rate by putting a chunk of money into imports and blocking the price spike internally. That has bad economic consequences. And so there needs to be a balancing uh, country by country. And final point, the energy transition, because energy is the starting point then for SDG 7, which is electricity access, which is so vital for the poor. It's also the starting point for fertilizer. Uh, and so we need to, as, as and the, the, Russia, the dependence on Russia had been huge on energy. And so the, I, I gave a speech a week ago, week and a half ago in Zurich, uh, the, the Churchill Symposium of as, as Europe is, so after World War II, Europe was facing the challenge of how to rebuild. Right now, Europe is, chasing, is facing the challenge of how to realign away from this dependence on uh, energy, this huge dependence on Russian energy. And that means 
uh, really having a frank discussion about a cleaner set of energy. I think, and you know, the G7 communique, uh, which was mentioned earlier, explicitly talks about the need for transition fuels, uh, which uh, means uh, Africa being willing to have natural gas production because it's so much cleaner than what's happening now. You know, today, day by day, we're seeing people shift uh, from uh, the, as Europe absorbs the uh, remaining available natural gas in the world, it cuts off developing countries. And their alternative, unless there's more production, their alternative is diesel, bunker fuel. So Madagascar, the president was in two weeks ago, they burn bunker fuel to make electricity in this biodiverse, uh, 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 very fragile economy. And that's the, we need to find uh, a better way to do that and Europe, so Europe has to be, I think, more explicit in the energy transition and realignment that they're that they're going through. There was there's active discussion of nuclear, but they have to decide that, and then active discussion of natural gas. Poland is taking natural gas from Norway, a new pipeline. Uh, Morocco is putting natural gas through, I mean, uh, Algeria is putting natural gas through Italy. Uh, the Eastern Mediterranean has it. And the trade-off is, uh, while it's a fossil fuel, it's uh, m much cleaner than the alternatives. And so this is something that the world has to really discuss and be open enough uh, to uh, uh, to have the discussion because the alternative is uh, I think substantially worse in terms of carbon intensity and it's already fully underway yeah. in uh, in the poorer countries. I mean, every day people should be feeling this. Did, you know, the the poorer countries, the rich people in the poorer countries buying diesel, di disconnecting from the grid, the grid breaks down, uh, and, uh, uh, and the carbon intensity of the countries one by one just goes through the roof, meaning they're using much more carbon dioxide uh, as we go forward. David and Matsui. Can I just, what, just a small footnote on that, Nana, if you permit me? We, we we uh, we'll close. Which is, you know, there is no difference conceptually between burning coal or bunker fuel in our own power plants here or in absorbing the natural gas here and forcing somebody else to burn coal, forcing somebody else. I was just saying there's no conceptual difference between burning bunker fuel here or Absorbing all the natural gas by taking it off the market and forcing somebody else who can no longer have access to that to burn that bunker fuel somewhere else. That is what is called a planetary problem. So, you know, the notion that somehow, and this is a little bit of hypocrisy here, which I, I feel strongly about, that we need to call out. We cannot say that natural gas is a clean fuel when it comes to our own needs. In, in the US and in Europe, but then be very reluctant to support natural gas projects in developing countries because we see that as a fossil fuel. So it's either clean or it's fossil, and it's both. But, but we have to be honest about it. So I'm very much uh, supporting this point that you just made, David, and, and I, I do want us to, to push that in, in our own uh, conversations. Uh, sometimes it's hard. I, I find that it's hard sometimes with my friends who will push back on it and say, well, you know, are you now in favor of every fossil fuel? No, I'm not in favor of every fossil fuel. Uh, but I do think that as a transition fuel, natural gas has a role to play. And, and it has a role everywhere, you know. Can, well, th well, thank you very we'll, much. We'll, <laughs> I, I will give you the, the it, last word. It, like, in, in I, I'd just like to end on a broader topic because <laughs> we, go we got into yes. a specific. Yes. On the broad topic, <laughs> world is facing these massive crises. It's really important to have discussion uh, of the solutions and the World Bank's in the middle of that and wants to be in the middle of that in many of these fields uh, from education, health, debt uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to how can countries grow and to climate. Thanks very much. Thanks everybody. Yes, that thank, must, you very much. Must, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for this opportunity.